Meg Lunsager is a Wilson Center Public Policy Scholar and a former U.S. Executive Director at the International Monetary Fund Executive Board. Kent Hughes, also a Wilson Center Public Policy Scholar, is former Director of the Program on America and the Global Economy. And with those introductions, I bet people can guess what we might be talking about today. Not your old uh, vaudeville routine, Lunsager and Hughes, when you were on the road. I want to talk about the economy. So we had this, this double whammy that our stock market has been reacting to. First, the problems in China. Now, this incredible drop of oil prices. I heard today that the steel barrel that contains the oil is actually more expensive than the oil inside with the current price of oil. Uh, talk about the impact on the United States stock market. We'll start there, and then we'll expand this globally. Well, I think the impact on the stock market has a lot to do with the fact that there are big energy companies that are in these uh, indexes. Mm -hmm. uh, the other side of the coin is that energy costs are lower for all of us. So for consumers, filling up their gas tank is much, much less. That should help with spending this year. But also for industry... Is that for, if we drive more as well? Well, even if you drive the same amount, right? You're spending less on gasoline. It depends on how much more you drive, how much bigger your car is, yeah. and, the, and the gas you're using. But it certainly helped good the auto industry. Sure. Yeah, good for the pocketbooks. And it certainly helped the auto industry this last year because sales were up uh, quite significantly for a little bit larger cars. So uh, in that respect, some of the real aspects of the economy are doing well. Uh -huh. uh, in terms of how the stock market will unfold, there are a lot of jitters that are translating around the world. We did have a positive sign today with uh, uh, Mario Draghi at the uh, European Central Bank indicating they'll probably mm -hmm. take some more stimulus actions in the next month or so. So hopefully that'll get uh, growth going in Europe a little bit more. Uh, but it is a strange mix of uh, some positive signals in the U.S. economy, employment up, uh, incomes up, uh, personal savings is still pretty strong. Uh, yet at the same time, we're seeing all these uh, jitters in the, uh, the stock markets rotating around the world. Kent, what are you focusing on? Well, I think the other side of the story is China. Mm -hmm. And China is going through a very complicated effort to try to shift from dependence on infrastructure investment and manufactured exports. And they're having some success. Services are actually increasing in China. Consumption is increasing. But they haven't clearly made that shift yet. So as they slow, of course, we'd love to be growing as fast as China is, but if they slow to their target of, say, 6.5% of GDP, that means they're buying less from Brazil, they're buying less from Australia, they're buying less even from Europe, and therefore they're buying less from us, those other countries. So that's another source of anxiety. Mm -hmm. The other end, you know, Meg made a really interesting point about how we ought to be seeing more consumption as a result of these dramatically dropped in gasoline prices and oil generally. But it seems that to some extent consumers are improving their balance sheet, that they are saving a little more rather than going rushing out to department store X or small shop Y. For many, it may mean just less debt versus more excess income to spend. Mm -hmm. the, the, the China question, you mentioned the anxiety. Often when we talk about the economy, it feels like we're talking about psychology because we're talking about anxiety and confidence and consumer confidence. Uh, on the China question, is this a matter of global confidence of China's ability to manage this slowdown in their growth? I think that's a, that's a good point because that was shaken a bit last summer. We saw the gyrations in the Shanghai uh, stock market and we're seeing that again in terms of the various measures the Chinese have been taken over the fall to try and liberalize their system, make it easier for more people to get financing in China. And at the same time then as they've relax some of the rules on their uh, currency in terms of how they manage their exchange rate, they've had to backtrack on that. And that has sent very confusing signals to the private sector and to households. And I think it's made a lot of people in China nervous. So a lot of what's going on is people trying to get their money out of China at this time. In part, it's been corporations trying to pay off uh, debt a little bit earlier because they're worried about a depreciating currency will cost them more to pay off their uh, dollar-denominated debt. But it's also been households, surprisingly, who are trying to get their money out of China. And there have been many more restrictions, not always uh, officially proclaimed or announced, but just basically uh, institutions told to slow down those withdrawals and those exits. So there's a lot going on that's not that obvious, and I think it has hurt the confidence in the system. The Chinese are trying to reassure the world that they will be more open and transparent and more consistent. But even today, Christine Lagarde chided them a little bit for uh, poor communications mm -hmm. in terms of how they're handling their exchange rate, uh, in terms of explaining to the world what exactly is going on. 
I know we're bouncing a bit between oil and China, but I want to ask another question about the oil prices. What, what can we expect in that regard? In, in other words, does, is there some bottoming out that occurs and a bounce back? And how long does this go on? And at what point does, this, does the economy sure. just adapt to the new normal? Well, at some point, you're going to have production drop, particularly where you have smaller producers who borrowed heavily to get into the shale revolution. So you will see perhaps a wave of bankruptcies followed by some consolidation. Larger companies have deeper pockets. They can buy those assets looking forward to when prices begin to recover. The other speculation, and it is really that, is that some specialists even see something as low as $10 a barrel. I don't myself think that's likely, but the fact that some serious observers would even suggest that figure suggests that we have not hit bottom yet. Wow. The, well, we've, we've focused on the two most obvious big stories in the economy, China and oil, but I, what I want to ask you now is other trends. M Meg had mentioned there's a mixed bag of things happening in, in the U.S. economy and really in all economies. I'd like each of you to tell us what, what are the trends we should be looking at beyond these two, uh, either positive or negative, but things that are going to have an impact on the global economy moving forward. I think we're all really looking for signals of stronger growth in various regions of the world. So we're hoping that Europe will have a little bit stronger recovery this year. The IMF thinks it'll be a bit better. Uh, we still have some uncertainties in terms of uh, Greece, but the bottom line is uh, all of the governments are going to have to spend more to support the refugees, the, uh, the migrants that have come in and trying to resettle them, educate them, get the children into schools. So, so that may help generate some demand, but it's also leading to a lot of uncertainty and political difficulties in many countries. So seeing how Europe unfolds will be, um, it'll be a real challenge for them and for the rest of us to figure out what's going on and, and to keep up with it. But at the same time, we have you know, serious economic difficulties in Russia because it's been very dependent on oil. And so uh, we have big budget adjustments coming in a number of countries. Fortunately, many emerging markets have more flexible exchange rates, and that's helped absorb some of the uh, adjustment. But we've seen, we're seeing a recession this year in Russia and in Brazil and pretty low growth in a lot of other countries. India is the bright spot frankly, in the world, but uh, India is just not big enough and uh, a big enough market for the rest of us to be a, an engine of growth for the global economy. India is a country to keep your eye on because if they fulfill their desire, they would love to be, in a sense, the next China. Mm -hmm. They're setting up special economic zones modeled on the Chinese approach. Modi clearly is interested in accelerating growth. So at some point in the future, they might provide that demand that's lacking now, but that's definitely several years into the future. One other thing I want to ask you about is you mentioned Davos earlier. I, I saw a Davos panel today rebooting the economy. Joseph Stiglitz said this, one of the primary factors contributing to the weak global economy is growing inequality. Those at the top don't have to spend as much of their income as those at the bottom who have to spend about 100%. When you have this growth of inequality, you're going to have a weak economy. And then earlier in the week, we saw this figure of 62 families or 62 individuals, was it, in the world who have as much wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion. What is this ball and chain doing to global economies? And is there any end in sight? Is there a solution that you can conceive of? Are there activities happening that might change the course? Well, that's, I think, a real difficult um, trend to discern. But uh, in terms of, I mean, uh, Professor Stiglitz has a very good point about they certainly, the very wealthy consume a much smaller percentage of their income than, than the rest of us do. Uh, and so the question is, what do they do with that wealth? Do they put it to productive use? Is it employing other people? That's what's not always so clear cut. And at the same time, then you have good parts, of, you know, large parts of the population living paycheck to paycheck and not feeling comfortable with increasing spending. This has been one concern of the Federal Reserve here in terms of wages haven't gone up as much as they would have thought in an economic recovery at this point. So that was one reason why they waited so long to raise interest rates. So how to see that unfolding over time, and it's, it's a real confluence of political and economic dynamics, because of course in a country like the US we value initiative and entrepreneurship and those people earning the rewards for taking those risks. So in terms of taking you know, major measures to redistribute wealth, that's, uh, that can be viewed as uh, anti-competitive and uh, undermine that. But even with that, and I'm not trying to make a political argument here, but can, can an economy, a global economy or an individual national economy survive that kind of gap? I think the question is particularly 
pointed in democracies. So the Americas have democracies, Europe, much of Asia has become a democracy. And at some point, if you have a majority of the people, and our statistics suggest that all this productivity growth over quite a number of years has ended up in the top 10, say, percent of the population. So almost always doing the right kind of investments in the future will cause some dislocation. And an individual being a rational voter would say, well, wait a minute. This is great for the economy, but it's all going to this small group of people. They, it makes me think of that old country and western song where a fellow is moaning about his divorce and says, she got the mine and I got the shaft. And I think a lot of people are feeling just like that. Uh, this another from Stiglitz today that uh, at the bottom, real wages adjusted for today are lower than they were 60 years ago. So it points to a problem that is, again, as Meg said, no easy solution. Yeah. The hard thing about making a 60-year-old comparison is you ignore all the innovations that have taken place. So a dollar that bought something, bundle of goods it's not in 1960, it's yeah. very different yeah. today. Well, this leads me to a sort of a final bottom line question, and it's about resilience. Uh, is the global economy, is the U.S. economy resilient enough to uh, sustain these, these hits, whether it was things we've seen in China or, or the drop in oil prices and the reaction to that? What about the resiliency question? I do think the U.S. economy is highly resilient. And uh, I noticed this when all my years at the fund. A number of other countries really aren't that resilient. In the United States, people continue trying to work. They continue trying to train themselves. Uh, they make the effort and they don't sit and wait for just to uh, live on unemployment for an extended period. I think that's changing. So is changing. resilience and attitude? I think it's resilience and attitude, and it's also the private sector, too. We welcome initiative here. People keep coming up with ideas, and they feel that they have the opportunity to try and implement those ideas. That's much more difficult in a lot of other countries. Uh, one of the problems in Europe is it's very difficult to undertake a lot of this sort of initiative and investment. There's a lot of overt regulation that prevents that, or labor laws that prevent you from hiring the kind of people you need. So um, I think that resilience is important in the United States, and which is what has helped us you know, in the long recovery from uh, that terrible recession, but also gives me hope for the future. I just hope that we can see more of that resilience emerging in, in the rest of the world. And I worry a little bit, for instance, in Europe, there's a not, of that, not enough of that internal flexibility mm -hmm. to allow that resilience to come forward. Well, I like the mostly optimistic part answer. Let's see if Kent either drags us down or, no, or echoes your I would your absolutely sentiment. second what Meg says. I think the U.S. economy is different. Mm -hmm. We're more risk-taking. Uh, there are even venture capitalists you'd talk to. They don't want to talk to anybody who hasn't failed at least once. So they'll learn what not to do in the future. That's just a very different culture. Uh, businesses are the same way. They're more flexible. They're looking at about how to change. Sometimes those changes are painful with a group of people who don't end up on the winning side of it. But the whole economy really is resilient in a way that virtually no other economy is. The one interesting experiment in Europe is Denmark, where they've adopted what they call flex security. So they keep a very open, flexible labor market. At the same time, if you're laid off, immediately your resume goes up on the internet. And if there's no job, then you're put into a training session that will improve your skills. And an example of supporting what Meg said, when we were having a really difficult time not too many years ago, California lowered its tuition costs for community colleges, and there was such an effort to upgrade the skills, they had to turn away 600,000 people. So we are different. Well, I'm going to take the good news and run, since there, there's, we can always <laughs> drift into bad news yes, as well. Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll look forward to speaking about these issues again. They clearly aren't going away. That's great. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us.